Anna Everett. Um, I work at the University of Connecticut and the um, Center for Behavioral Education and Research in the NEAG School of Education um, and the uh, Northeast PBIS Network. And this is Katie Meyer. I'm Katie Meyer. I work with Susanna um, and all of the acronyms that you see below. <laughs> <laughs> We're super excited to um, be with you today to talk a little bit about systems for implementing advanced tiers. And we are going to, um, just to give you a little warning, we think that all of these systems are generalizable to every kind of school um, from pre-K to 12, but our examples today will be mostly focused on secondary schools. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a few minutes. The PowerPoint will certainly be available. And that, thank you, Melissa. I will also share with you that we um, will kind of be watching the questions in the chat. We'd love to have you write questions or respond to anything. We most likely will respond to most of our, your questions at the end today, just because of the webinar format. Um, but please feel free to type in questions um, or examples. We'd love to hear a little bit about kind of what you're thinking about and what you're working on with all of these pieces. So in our hour that we have today together, we are hoping to spend a little bit of time talking about these really critical systems um, that really support staff to implement advanced tiers. Um, we are, uh, we know that um, these are just, you know, these are just so um, in our work with schools with a, to implement, excuse me, advanced tiers, we've just really learned that all of these different areas that we'll touch on today have been so important in terms of helping teams to really get um, advanced tiers up and running and then sustained over time. So we're um, excited to share with, with you some examples. And as I mentioned, I think all of these will really fit for all of you across all of your different contexts. But because we know a little bit less about how this works in secondary set settings, um, and because Katie and I have the opportunity to work with some secondary schools on this and explore and learn from them, we will mostly um, use examples pulled from that, um, from those experiences. And I think because it's a little harder to implement advanced tiers in secondary settings, the systems become even all that more important. So that's what we're planning on talking about today. Um, as always, we pull from all of these different resources and probably more in our slides today. So um, thank you to all of these folks. Um, you'll probably recognize some familiar slides and these are where they're from. And before we dive into some of our, um, the teaming structures and data systems and decision rules, just a reminder, and plus there wouldn't, we couldn't have a PBIS webinar without some circles, um, just a reminder around what systems are and how important they are and how central they are um, to implementation and sustainability of practices over time. And I'm gonna turn this over now to Katie, who's gonna talk a little bit about teaming structures. Thanks, Susanna. So as Susanna was saying, one of the key um, systems to support advanced tiers implementation, as in tier one implementation, is the teaming structures that you create. So there are a variety of different um, teaming teams or possibly conversations, depending on how you organize your teams. And so some of you may be familiar with this graphic, but I think it provides a nice um, explanation of the different conversations that happen at each tier of a multi-tiered model. So your universal team is talking about your school-wide and class-wide supports. Um, your targeted systems team may be the same as your tier two problem-solving team, or it may be the same as your tertiary systems team, but that team uses process data and they primarily talk about, you know, how many uh, students do we have on our various interventions? How are students responding, you know, in the aggregate to those interventions? Are available interventions meeting our students' needs? And in general, they kind of assess the health of the system. So that may be um, a smaller team 
And it's generally a standing team. Again, it may be the same as the tertiary systems team. Then you also have your problem solving team. Um, and that team tends to be um, at the tier three level, more targeted towards the individual student that you're supporting. Um, at the tier two level, it may be a standing team as well. And that problem solving team um, you know, uses the FBA process to discuss one student at a time. So they may talk about two to three kids um, in 60 minutes, but it's a more intensive uh, focused conversation about those particular students. So we can group these, I think, into systems conversations that may span across both tier two and tier three. Um, and then in, in a second, we'll talk about those problem solving conversations. And in terms of the systems conversations, you can think about this um, in terms of what's the composition of those teams that have the, the systems conversations and what activities are they engaged in. And although the data that's used for these systems level conversations will differ depending on the tier, um, the process and the activities are pretty similar between tiers two and three. So there may be separate teams that are responsible for maintaining and evaluating systems at tier two and tier three. Or as I said before, it might be a combined team. Again, that kind of depends on the size of your school um, and the existing teams that you already have in place. But it's important for these conversations to happen at least monthly. These systems conversations that you know, review the health of the system should happen at least monthly. In terms of composition, it's helpful to identify who's going to be bringing which data to the meetings. And the team should also decide what format the data should be pre presented in so that it supports the team's decision-making process. And finally, in terms of composition, it's so critical to engage students and families in the development of your advanced tier systems, especially at the high school level. Um, their input really helps to ensure the systems, the procedures, and the interventions at your advanced tiers are relevant and that they're sustained. So I know this can be really challenging for schools. You know, we've worked with schools that have made a lot of effort to recruit um, input from students and families. And some of those same strategies that work at tier one to engage students um, and families can be used. So, you know, focus groups, um, using regular surveys, sending those out, having open meetings where you invite, um, you know, anyone or maybe particular students or families to uh, come in and attend and provide their feedback and input. All of those can be successful ways to get student and family representation. Um, you wanna also, you know, as always make sure that most of the students and families that are engaged are the ones who have some direct experience with your advanced tier system. So kids that are enrolled in various tier two or tier three interventions, um, you, you know, you wanna get feedback from them. Um, and this is such a great leadership opportunity for students. And it helps to ensure that those advanced tier systems and practices are accessible, that they reflect and respect the community values, and that they integrate other sources of support, such as you know, community-based mental health um, or physical health supports, uh, coaches, uh, after-school activities um, or, or school care into those advanced tier systems, especially at the tier three level where, um, you know, you may be looking more at kind of a wraparound type of a model. Um, the activities at the systems team include, you know, providing professional development, articulating the student identification process, monitoring the overall fidelity and outcomes of tier two uh, and or tier three interventions, and coordinating with other relevant teams. So this may include teams at the tier one level. Um, if you have separate teams at tier two and tier three, it would include coordinating with those other teams, uh, as well as your problem solving teams, any administrative or leadership teams. And it's also helpful to coordinate with, you know, the district at the district level. Next, just thinking about those problem solving conversations, uh, you know, we found that Schools have teams that do this already. So this is more common, uh, more commonly in place than the systems level conversations. 
So this probably looks and sounds familiar. Um, it's really helpful just to consider the function of your existing teams and kind of have a checklist and say, you know, does our existing school team, problem solving team already have these members as a part of it? Do we have a team that already does most of this? Can that structure be shaped a little bit um, to improve efficiencies? And it's usually more of that shaping rather than, you know, creating a new team. So these problem solving teams, you know, as we said, discuss one student at a time. They develop the intervention for that student, monitor progress and fidelity of implementation, and then modify the intervention as necessary. And many of the guidelines around systems and scheduling in particular uh, and operating procedures are consistent across all the tiers uh, to ensure efficient, effective, and timely team meetings. So these probably look familiar. Um, and teams that I've seen be most effective tend to have really clearly defined uh, process that the team uses and roles. So someone is identified to bring the data that's already summarized to the team meeting, and that allows teams to you know, move forward with their problem solving process. And after that brief overview of Teams, um, I'm going to turn it over to Susanna to talk about data systems and decision roles. Thanks, Katie. I'm going to pick up on a lot of the pieces that Katie just touched on, um, but with a specific focus around advanced tiers data systems. Um, as you all know and are familiar, we need to be a little bit more intense and a little more precise with our data collection when we're thinking about advanced tiers. So just a reminder that um, one of the things that teams tackle um, when they're thinking about advanced tiers is how do we identify students who need additional supports at our school? Um, and what, how are, what data sources are we considering when we're, um, when we're thinking about that? Are we thinking about our nominations and how those are available to students and staff? Are we thinking about, um, do we have a school-wide screener? Um, and if that's in place, how are we using it? And um, how is it helping us make good decisions about who needs support and what supports they might need? Um, and then also what data sources are we using? Um, what extant data sources are we using to identify students? And again, that might be different depending on your context. Um, as you all know, for advanced tiers, it's so important to make sure that we are really not missing students. Um, we know often students with externalizing concerns, we wanna make sure that we, we've certainly been reminded over the last couple of years, making sure that we're catching kids who have more internalizing concerns. So I, I know folks have made a lot of progress on this and certainly the schools that we're working at with, I, I, it used to be that talking about SEL screeners or um, school-wide screeners was a little less common. And now it feels like most districts that we're talking to are in the process of thinking about taking one on or have already adopted one. So that's super exciting. Then we know once students are identified, we have to figure out, um, again, which map how to match them best to the interventions that they might need um, and how to support them in that intervention. And then monitoring that student progress. So, Data plays a role in all of those um, all of those decisions. Um, we have to think about um, again, not only sorry, not monitoring student progress in that intervention, and then making decisions about whether we need to intensify supports or whether we need to um, start to fade supports and to take a look at that information over time. So um, we use data so fluently and regularly at advanced tiers, but that a lot goes into that. Um, we know that that there. As Katie mentioned for teams, that we have to have data sources we've identified. We also have to be looking at that data on a regular basis, making decisions about how often we're going to look at our different data sources. Are we looking at our screening tools twice a year? Are we looking at um, office discipline referrals more regularly, like weekly? Are we looking at attendance, et cetera? And one of the things that we've really found and have been super impressed with is at secondary schools, their data fluency is phenomenal. The ability of teams at secondary schools to really look across different data sources and summarize is really incredible. So um, we've been really pleased and have learned so much from folks about kind of how they've managed to look at all of that together. But I will say, um, before we go on to the next slide, 
um, is one of the things that, you know, we can have a lot of data, but we need your team to be looking at that on a regular basis and making decisions. Katie and I were with the team on Monday this week, and they had, um, their system had screened kids, and they had a certain number of kids in their sort of yellow, red, you know, that their their data system had highlighted that they were considering for check-in, check-out. Then the team started going through those data sources and through the students and realized that most of those students weren't in school and were having a lot of attendance issues. So they, the team just shifted all together and said, okay, we think that actually check in check out is going to be more applicable to our freshmen who are here, who need a little bit of additional um, supports and who need a little bit, um, you know, some more attention, adult attention will be responsive to that. So if they were just using their data system in a kind of uh, rigid way, they would have identified a lot of kids who weren't there and weren't weren't available to get the check-in, check-out intervention. So I think that's, that's a really important piece when we talk about data is always in the context of team decisions. Katie, you can do the next slide. So I think I've talked about all of these pieces already, but one of the things that we want to make sure is to increase um, everyone's, uh, the transparency for everyone about not only how students are identified for intervention, but how progress is monitored once students are getting additional supports. And then again, how do students either graduate or exit or fade from intervention, which is often a hard a hard conversation to have. But when we have those decision rules, um, which we'll talk about a little bit more, we can increase our efficiency around, um, around our team conversations. And we can increase our, um, transparency with students, with their families, and with staff. Um, So everyone knows that this process is there um, and how uh, students, again, can access more supports, for example, um, and how they might, you know, what those decisions are when they may graduate or fade from the intervention. So here is just a quick example. Um, And again, this is going to depend on the context in which that you're in, which data sources that you're using. And as I mentioned earlier, I've found, we found that the high schools that we work with, the secondary schools are really wonderful at kind of pulling these pieces together, you know, across data sources um, in one place so that they are looking on that, at that in, on a regular basis. And I think high schools have, you know, really used early warning indicators and some other um, data sources regularly to help with this process. But what we have found that's really difficult, um, but we've really supported teams in trying to do is doing that kind of decision rule process is thinking about, okay, what in for our context, what makes sense of what's proficient, what's at risk, what's at high risk um, for our students and how are we looking at that on a regular basis? And that is um, that's just been challenging. And I think we've um, we've found over the years that we've really tried to push this piece a little bit more um, explicitly to help support the systems um, to work again. You can have great decision rules, like I used that example of the team earlier, but you still need the team to take a look. So they had identified those students as at risk and then decided that that intervention wasn't appropriate for them, but still had those decision rules in place. And then that facilitated that conversation. And I think I have another. um, Oh, so another sort of systems piece that we find that's incredibly helpful. Once you've identified some of those data sources and your team is getting someone is collecting those regularly, someone's summarizing them, sharing with them with the team before their meeting. We've also really found, especially at the secondary level, um, that uh, a targeted intervention organizer is incredibly helpful. This is from PBIS apps, um, but we've really found that um, with teams across all um, grade levels, but especially with secondary teams, that to really do a thorough intervention inventory has been tremendous. So for a couple of different reasons, one is just obviously kind of working on those those decision rules. So thinking about what a description of the intervention, um, what box it might check, um, a little bit around who's coordinating it, and then to write down again, those entry criteria, what data are we using um, to decide whether a student is appropriate for that intervention? How are we gonna make decisions um, if we're gonna, a student might fade from that intervention? And, or, or again, or get more increased supports. And then what data are we gonna collect um, to monitor student progress? So this has served a couple of great purposes, I think for our teams. One is to really think about, um, again, developing those decision rules and getting them down for each intervention. And another um, 
purpose that this has served, especially at the secondary level. And for folks who are here, you'll probably, this will resonate with you. We've found that um, for high schools, they have a ton of interventions. There's tons of stuff that's in place um, for high schools across credit recovery and academic supports and often outside mental health agencies coming in and providing supports for students, but that those interventions have often been very siloed and that there is not a team like Katie's talked about earlier, who's really monitoring the health of the system to help us help staff and help um, help students to know what's in place, um, what's available, and how students might access um, those supports. So that has been, again, the same training that Katie and I were in on Monday. We were talking to another team and they were just talking about they have all these pieces in place and putting it down on paper and kind of doing this inventory has been incredibly helpful and they will plan on communicating that with the rest of their staff so that you know sometimes kids just like get into an intervention because they talk to one person that day that happens to know about that intervention um, and doing this comprehensive systemic process of inventorying has been super helpful so we have a couple of examples um, Katie that you might want to share um, this is from PBIS apps um, Again, the description, what intervention do you have in place? A quick description of what it is, who's coordinating entry and exit criteria, and then again, how we're gonna monitor um, the data uh, in terms of the student progress and um, kind of taking a look at that. So if you do not, if you have not done this already, um, I highly will have, a, we have a link for this at the end of the slides, um, but I highly recommend that you um, download this targeted intervention organizer. It can certainly work um, at tier three as well um, and start to work. This is a great uh, activity for your team to do. And we've just really found it to be powerful, again, especially with secondary schools. Here's a, an example from a school that we work with um, and they, again, um, they thought about kind of that transition between eighth and ninth grade and working on with an academic support teams, um, and how those students are identified, how they are, um, how they're referred and who the contact person might be. And again, sharing this with all staff really provides that support for all staff, um, to know what's in place and, um, and how they can, how students can access those, those great interventions that often folks don't know about. Thanks, Susanna. And Thanks, there was a question in the chat about, um, you know, do you always link the decision rules to a specific intervention? Um, Great question. What do you think, Katie? I mean, I think it's generally your team is always going to make a, de a decision on a student, um, but I think it's good to try to work towards those. What do you think, Katie? Yeah, I've seen I've seen both. I've yeah. seen teams that develop kind of more global decision rules around this is generally what will kind of set off a red flag for this yeah. student may need additional yeah. support. Right. Um, and I think that that is helpful. If, But I don't think that in and, of, in and of itself is sufficient in terms of matching students to the correct intervention. So I think yeah. it's definitely um, important to have these criteria that identify, you know, what are the entry criteria for each of these interventions Absolutely. so that you get yeah. the right kids. Yeah. And I think we sometimes confuse that kind of those two steps, that piece of like identifying students who need more support, but then the next step is really matching them to the interventions that you have in place and what contextually makes sense, um, what's in place for you resource wise, and then like what's in place um, for how it meets student needs. And you're going to, the decision rules are going to be super helpful but in both steps, but they're, I think, identifying those for the different um, different interventions is helpful. So, yeah. And what we I, found in working with high schools is that high schools have a ton of yeah, yeah. two interventions um, so and many. so many. And it's often like this school, for example, when we were working with this team, you know, there were people on their team that weren't really that familiar with some of the tier two interventions. And these are, you know, the people who are on the tier two team. <laughs> so they're familiar with a lot of that stuff. So I think I, it, because oh, sorry, go ahead. Big, um, it's not uncommon for there to be interventions that just staff aren't that familiar with. Yeah. And I think this process for this team, they took like a whole day to do this intervention. They did some homework, they did some research and found out like who's doing what. And um, it was incredibly helpful for them. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Um, so another, I think, integral part of system supports for advanced tiers is professional development and coaching strategies. And 
I think that the conversation, you know, that Suzanne and I were just having before kind of speaks to this need because a lot of times staff aren't that familiar with the advanced tier system, how students get, you know, identified or nominated or even what the supports, you know, what supports are available. So that's where professional development and coaching comes in. And I'd love if, you know, if you have a chance to think while we're talking about this for folks to type in strategies that you've used in your school to either provide professional development um, to all staff uh, or strategies that you've used and people that you've used um, to provide coaching, because I think that that piece is also really important. Um, We know that in order for tier two and tier three interventions to be delivered quickly and to be delivered effectively, it's, you know, it's critical that staff have some knowledge of the interventions and the skills to implement them. And increasingly, tier two and tier three supports are provided at least partially in the classroom. And even if that skill instruction is occurring in a pullout setting, it's still critical that classroom staff and, you know, just the staff in general are familiar with those skills so that they can promote generalization into the classroom, because that's really where we want to see the change, right? Um, so therefore, it's, you know, very important that that staff receive training in those interventions, as well as some in vivo coaching to, to support them in effectively implementing these targeted and intensive interventions. So what does that look like? Um, The professional development explicit training piece at tier two, it's helpful for really all staff to be familiar with the available interventions. So whether those are academic interventions, social, emotional interventions, behavioral, homework clubs, um, you know, the whole variety of tier two interventions that that are available. Um, Helpful for staff to know that those are around and have a general idea of what they are. And also staff need to know how to refer students, um, how progress will be monitored, and as Susanna was talking about, um, how students will exit the intervention. And I think it's important that the understanding is there from the beginning that the goal is to exit students from these tier two and tier three interventions. Um, At tier three, we know some students may continue to need additional support, um, but especially at tier two, the hope and the goal is that after the tier two intervention, students will be able to to exit at some point. So having that be the the understanding from the beginning is helpful. At tier three, um, you know, Staff will be involved if they have a student that is receiving tier three supports. It may be just individual staff that are involved in providing that. But it's important for all staff to know how those tier three systems and supports operate in their school. Like, what is the process um, for students to, to receive tier three supports? And what is the role of, you know, the classroom teacher, for example? on that tier three team if they have a student that has tier three needs. In addition, it's helpful for all staff to know how students become eligible um, for, and for them to understand, um, you know, just the basic understanding of function of behavior, because that will help, that will help at the tier one and the tier two level, but will also be beneficial when they're, if and when they're supporting an individual student. Coaching, um, so explicit training and professional development is, I would say, necessary but not sufficient um, for effective tier two and tier three implementation. And we tend to talk about coaching as sort of one thing, but there's actually you know different layers that are provided by different people. And some of you, many of you, are probably familiar with these different uh, aspects of coaching, but we'll review them quickly. So. First, there's systems coaching, and in systems coaching, the focus is really on helping the teams build the organizational systems and the operating procedures that are needed to fully implement and sustain advanced tiers. So this could be support with 
um, developing systems, policies, procedures, um, defining team operating procedures, using aggregated student data for making decisions about, again, sort of the general health of the system and measuring fidelity. And systems coaching is typically provided by somebody um, with expertise in school-wide PBIS, uh, as well as advanced tiers systems, implementation science, and data systems. So this is oftentimes an external coach, either someone at the district level, um, or maybe it's someone that is contracted outside of the school uh, system. Uh, team coaching typically focuses on helping the team effectively design, monitor, implement, and then adapt if necessary interventions at the advanced tiers level. So this is coaching that's provided to that problem solving team. And it could include, you know, how to install check and check out or how to evaluate fidelity of different social skills groups. That can be really tricky, figuring out how to um, evaluate fidelity of those groups. Um, or it could be coaching in how to design and evaluate function-based uh, behavior support plans at tier three. And this is typically provided by someone with applied behavioral expertise. And it may be someone who's school-based, like if you have a, a BCBA, or it may be somebody at the district level. And then finally, individual, or sometimes it's called instructional coaching. Um, this is the sort of real-time, in-person, applied coaching that focuses on um, how to effectively implement an intervention, whether it's a tier two intervention or a behavior support plan at, at tier three. And it generally involves, you know, modeling, role play, uh, providing feedback to staff on different aspects of the intervention, um, any adaptations that may be necessary, um, you know, in the setting, a lot of times we develop these plans and then maybe they don't quite, you know, 100% translate to the actual context. So it's helpful to have somebody there to um, provide feedback and, and support on how to make those adaptations. Uh, it could also include coaching around, you know, recording data or, um, or just problem solving any barriers that tend to come up when implementing an intervention. And this is generally provided by someone in the school um, with some behavioral knowledge. So helpful to think about those three levels of coaching. And again, if you have examples of how you're doing this in your school, either at the, the systems level, the team level, the individual level, um, please drop them in the chat. I see that there are some great examples um, in there. So thanks for sharing. This is an example from a district that, that we've been working with and they got creative with their existing infrastructure. And so they have identified someone at the district level who is the behavioral support um, coordinator. And that person then provides support and coaching to individuals at each school. So this particular district has two high schools, as well as um, some middle schools and elementary schools. And each school has an advanced tiers PBIS coach, or generally two um, advanced tiers PBIS coaches. And then they also have one to two um, tier one school-wide PBIS coaches. And so they've kind of developed this, um, I don't know, waterfall model where the district provides support to the advanced tiers and tier one coaches. And then those coaches provide support to either at the advanced tiers level, they have um, programs called Rise and Reset that are kind of an alternative to um, in-school suspension or um, detention. And instead they're meant to be really quick um, conversations with students when they're having a difficult time with the goal of getting them back into the classroom um, as soon as possible. So that's kind of the reset program. And then the RISE program is more instructional. And again, it's more of a um, replacement for detention or in-school suspension. And it's, you know, goal-oriented problem solving and providing skills that students can use to, um, you know, address their needs. So the advanced tiers coaches then coach the 
the program coordinators of those programs and, you know, kind of mirrored the school-wide PBIS coaches, coach, um, the team, and the rest of the school in implementing Tier 1 PBIS. So this allocation of resources has been, you know, I think really helpful for, for this district in providing a variety of support to their, to their staff. Katie, before we go on to district supports, um, a couple of folks mentioned uh, they have they do videos um, to uh, to share for staff, like brief videos to do some um, training. Also, um, someone mentioned making sure that they're pushing in um, staff PD during uh, staff like a, a P, like staff break time um, or planning time so that it's not mm, a great and always at the end of the day when everyone is exhausted. Um, someone also asked uh, the question about kind of in terms of shifting over to coaching, thinking about um, can one coach provide all three levels of coaching that you were talking about earlier? So I just thought I'd throw that in. And Yeah, I think um, possibly, I think it can be difficult for, it depends on who the person is, I guess. Yeah. And yeah. their what their knowledge base is. It can be difficult. You want you want someone in the building available for that individual coaching mm-hmm. yeah. um, because they can kind of hop in when needed, not just when there are issues, but you know, kind of pop in at any time and support um, teachers and staff with implementation of, of those systems. And it can be, I think difficult for someone who would be more at the district level, um, who might be overseeing and supporting, you know, a variety of schools with their systems implementation to to be able to do that. So m- maybe, yeah. but yeah, yeah. It usually, be, I it see it kind of break out okay. along. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, oftentimes there's the same. You might have someone in in the building who provides both the team and the individual coaching. Mm-hmm. Um, and then someone more at the district level that provides the systems coaching systems pieces. Yeah, absolutely. One other quick thing before we move on to district supports, which we're already talking about, um, but I just mentioned, and, and I think um, this is a particular challenge, moving back to staff professional development and coaching. Um, I think that is definitely more challenging at the secondary level. We have found, obviously, just because there are, you know, high schools are bigger and they're organized by departments and there's rarely time or not often time when everyone is together. So being creative, we've been really impressed with how creative our teams have been around making sure they're getting to all staff, whether they're coming to department meetings and doing trainings there, um, or they're, um, again, being thoughtful too about who is presenting the professional development around some advanced tiers work, um, that it's not always the same people, that it's maybe not always the administrator. Um, So being thoughtful about that, I think has been really interesting. And then I just typed in the chat too, I think it is really helpful for staff like anything, like for tier one or any advanced tiers to follow up with professional development and coaching, to give them feedback, to share data. This is how many kids we're supporting in this intervention. Thank you so much for, you know, doing this, doing some problem solving around how it's going. Um, As always, I think it's really useful to do um, a pilot first and then share that information back with folks about how things went. So, and again, you know, we just talking about that in very general terms, not obviously talking about individual student progress, which you might do with an individual teacher, of course, but to think a little bit about sharing some of that systems information with staff is helpful too. Yeah. Anything yeah, else that we should, any other questions about um, professional development or coaching? Okay. I'm going to just wrap up our, um, oh, I know. Oh, survey staff on skills and talent. That's great. I appreciate that, Rick. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think getting volunteers and helping, um, thinking a little bit about who can help provide training is is really useful. Um, and yeah, thinking about who that messenger is, is is very important. So we've kind of touched upon all of this um, in our conversations, and Katie talked about it a lot um, just now in terms of uh, district level supports. But I'll just say generally, I have found that, um, or we've found that the schools that we've worked with who've been most successful around implementation of advanced tiers really have some really solid district level support. So some of you might be those people. Um, And so that's wonderful. Um, For those of you who are more school-based, um, I would think a little bit about, you know, how to advocate for that district support um, or thinking about who it is that's um, that's supporting you at the district level. 
Um, but all of these pieces, I think, take um, someone or a team, ideally, a leadership team at the district level, who's really thinking about integration. Um, because we know at advanced tiers, um, that in- integration of, of services and supports is incredibly helpful for students and their families. So who's thinking through those kind of across silo um, systems that we sometimes have across academics, mental health, behavioral supports, um, and and who's really putting all of those pieces together um, for, um, for school teams. So that um, I think has been incredibly valuable um, for the schools that we've been working with. And then there's also the sort of the logistic pieces, right? It's like data systems. So we have one school that we work with who have integrated a school climate questions within their um, data system, their school-wide data system, would they use Panorama? And they use that information, kids fill out, fill that out, and they use that for intervention identification um, and for, you know, school-wide feedback, and then also like helping to identify kids for interventions. Um, but there's someone at the district level that kind of built that and put that in. Um, so that's important. Or for example, Katie was just talking about the district that we work with um, that uses Rise and Reset. So we want to make sure, of course, that we um, do not, uh, are, are not just layering things on top of staff and someone at the district or the team at the district level helps us think about how do we integrate across um, these different efforts. We're not just saying, okay, you're going to do, for example, rise and reset, and we're going to do this. We were thinking a lot as a team and then as a district team about how those pieces are fitting together. So um, that takes someone who's thinking about uh, school or I'm sorry, not someone. I make doing a misrule, and I've done that a couple of times. A team at the district level who's thinking about um, that uh, those kind of top pieces that you all have seen probably before around stakeholder engagement, um, funding and alignment, and policy, and thinking about capacity, which is really important. Another team member we talked to we talked to this week were like, we've had data to identify students, but we now finally, thanks to some grant funding, have staff to help implement these interventions. So really thinking about what is our data telling us about the needs that we have at the district level. And then again, kind of thinking about how to support um, individual teams um, both at the systems level and um, and for individual school students, uh, as Katie was talking about. So I'm just going to um, share a couple of quick examples. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, one school district that we worked with uh, did an amazing job, and this was a multi-year process, um, of really thinking about doing some comprehensive mental health screening across grades. And they actually start in third grade. Um, but for uh, high school students, it's very comprehensive and regular mental health screening um, for all high school students. So this um, took a district level um, initiative uh, that they worked very hard with the um, to, you know, to approach the superintendent, assistant superintendent, the school board to work on policy to make this happen. Um, They had a team in place to choose these different measures that they thought would give them the data that they needed to provide interventions for students in the high school. Um, And then also, again, thinking a lot about how you communicate that with stakeholders. Um, So really doing a good push out of like, kind of talking to families about what does this mean? And, you know, what are we collecting and why? Um, But they've done a very comprehensive job of doing of doing that work um, over over years. And their, you know, their experience was certainly, again, to pilot a couple of measures or I think pilot this whole process within a small group of students and then to really um, to expand it out over time. But we've just learned a ton from them around that district level support to do this work, to provide data that's really going to help identify students who need additional supports and really be timely about that. and to really think about, um, also think about the health of the district, right? Is like, what do we have in place? Um, what what interventions do we have in place? And is it meeting student need across our whole district? So this was a great example, I think, of district leadership um, to help support the schools and especially the secondary school that we worked with um, to really implement the screening process. And then my last example is I just talked to a district level coach the other day and she was talking a lot about, and this is kind of getting up into tier three, but she was focused 
a lot of her role is focused on just making sure that everyone is trained. So the district has decided to use, I think they use CPI, um, and she has done a wonderful job of making sure that there is district-wide coaching for crisis intervention for all staff. So they have about a quarter of their staff trained in CPI, and this is a large urban district um, outside of Boston, And but they've made that decision for that crisis intervention training, and they've really committed to, um, to training a good number of staff so that people are using the same language, they're using the same de-escalation strategies, um, and the teams are in place at each school. Um, oh, I will share, Nikki, I will share you with you the district um, in a couple minutes um, that did uh, do the implemental health process, because there's some great stuff on their website, and I can even share um, the district level person their email with you as well. Um, the other thing that uh, this district that I've worked with um, also has uh, provided is really thinking about they have a they've made a commitment to a specific approach to behavior support plans. So she's done such a wonderful job of ensuring that all administrators are trained on these behavior support plan this approach to behavior support plans. Not again that the administrators are going to be. Um, necessarily um, implementing directly the behavior support plans, but they are part of teams. They are help. They are there. They have the language and the knowledge around individualized behavior supports, which in my experience, sometimes administrators, we don't include them in those conversations and we need to. So that was really impressive. She's worked really hard on doing that. Um, and again, they have a collaborative problem solving process that they've adopted at a district level where they have also really sort of pushed out um, training for everyone, um, their school teams to really adopt this model. So that getting everyone on the same page and using the same language around advanced tiers, um, and especially at tier three, has been incredibly valuable and a ton of work. I mean, she's, she's in buildings all the time, but meeting with administrators regularly um, to talk about implementation um, and fidelity. So that's just been amazing. She just said, you know, we've it's been a priority for their district team to like really train all of their leaders. So that was my other example um, that I, you know, of, of a, a good, good district level team um, and how they've kind of used their resources to support um, the schools in their district. Yeah. And I just wanted to highlight something that Melissa had put in the chat. Um, she said that they also provide basic behavioral science learning for all of their mm -hmm. staff. Mm -hmm. And She's found that as staff better understand some of the basics of behavior science, science um, supporting implementation of behavior interventions seems to be going more smoothly. So I think that's such a, yeah, such a great practice and a critical, you get so much bang for, for that buck <laughs> in yeah, terms of absolutely. training time because it really supports implementation at, you know, across all the tiers. Yeah, that's great. And I will say, um, Nikki, your question was actually about the interventions that the district implemented um, for the mental health screening process. I've talked to their district a lot in the beginning when they were, um, I think they were doing sort of brief cognitive behavioral interventions. But let me give you, I'll put the, um, I'll stick the website for that district in the chat and you can take a look um, and, and they will have some more information about kind of what they had in place. Yeah, I know um, it says on the right there, some of their, the screeners that they used, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, the interventions as well. Yeah. So um, Katie, did you want to talk a little bit about, re oh, we're talking about lessons learned. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, we've learned a lot through our partnership with the high schools that we've worked with implementing advanced tiers. And we kind of organized these into several key lessons learned, especially related to initial implementation. Um, and one of those key lessons is just how critical it is to continue investing and implementing tier one. Um, you know, especially we're continuing to work with these schools and especially in the last two years since the pandemic has hit. Um, you know, I just can't say enough about a solid foundation of tier one systems is so essential for the development of advanced tiers. And even with strong tier one foundations, we found that it's been beneficial to spend time, you know, with, with the schools that we're working with assessing uh, tier one, reviewing and supporting implementation of tier one systems and practices. So we've used, you know, the TFI and, and really worked with them on um, developing those 
communication systems between teams so that everybody is on the same page. Another lesson learned was how much teams valued connecting with one another and networking with other high school teams. Um, early on in the training series that we were providing, coaches and team members you know, came up to us and requested more time to hear from one another and to be able to share ideas. So we made sure to incorporate whole group discussion time into the trainings that we had for teams um, to give them an opportunity to you know, share their current practices, what they were doing, any barriers that they were encountering, um, brainstorm solutions. And <clears throat> during this networking time, you know, I think teams just learned so much from one another and brainstormed ideas and celebrated progress and problem solved challenges and barriers that were specific to the high school context. So I think even if, you know, even if you're in a district with multiple high schools, it can be helpful to hear from other high schools outside of uh, your district. And I'll share, we'll share um, in a couple slides some resources, but we recommend checking with your regional PBIS network to see if they facilitate a community of practice for high schools. Um, we offer one in the Northeast and we meet every other month. Um, there's also uh, the PBIS high school network that is organized by APBS and they have um, monthly hour long they call them think tanks, and um, and they're just they're just great opportunities to kind of hear from other high schools, not just around tiered, you know, advanced tiers, but you know, across tiers of implementation. And then finally, um, our our third lesson learned, big lesson learned, was how critical it was, and we say this and hear this all the time. I'm sure, but like align, align, align but how important it is to align academic, social, emotional, behavioral, and mental health efforts. Um, we found that high schools often have multiple tier two interventions in place to support students' mental health, um, as well as their you know, academic, social, emotional, and behavioral needs. Um, however, because high schools are so big, um, oftentimes these interventions tend to be siloed and are uncoordinated. And so we found that it's important to clarify from the beginning that tier two uh, framework encompasses all of these interventions. Uh, we we kind of ran across a misconception that tier two of PBIS applies only to behavioral interventions and um, found that outcomes can result in, you know, that can result in continued inefficiencies in the referral process, um, in the delivery of interventions, and in monitoring progress. So working towards aligning um, all of those into an integrated framework, again, is a lot of work, um, but really pays off in terms of um, matching students to the appropriate intervention. And, um, and, and that includes you know, what we've been talking about in terms of informing staff of tier two and tier three systems and, um, just communicating the 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 purpose of of the framework. Susanna, did you want to add anything to that? I just thought I'd pop back in. Okay, great. I, no, that's great. <laughs> exactly all um, the things that Katie said. So we'll open up for questions in just a second, but um, just wanted to share a few resources with you. We didn't want to inundate um, folks with a ton of of resources, but. On the left, there are several articles, including uh, the one that Susanna and Marcy Handler <clears throat> and Jen Freeman and I um, put together that talk about some of those lessons learned from initial implementation of advanced tiers. There's also a tier two guide on uh, data systems and practices that's available on the, the National Center's website. Both of those first two articles are available at pbis.org. And then finally, um, um, Kittleman and Associates at University of Oregon published a paper um, that is available through ERIC, so you don't need to have uh, you know, access to the journal, but they talk specifically about adaptations to check in, check out in high schools that is helpful. Yeah, that's a really user-friendly article. Yeah. And then on the right, um, there's information on if you're interested in joining the PBIS High School Network, um, and if you contact 
um, either of the folks that are that organize that you can get you know put on the list for the networking calls and yes we'll place the links in the chat too um and then if you're interested if you're in the northeast and interested in joining the high school networking calls you can contact me and then there's a link to the intervention inventory that Susanna um was talking about Katie are you okay with putting those in the chat that's great yeah I'll drop Thank those in you. the chat Thanks so much. And Rick, I think um, your question about staff turnover is so, I mean, that's always an issue, right? But that's so important right now. It's been really such a challenge for schools. And again, I mean, not to like kind of sound like a broken record, but that's why the systems are so important because if someone who you're checking check out um, coordinator person has left, um, that means your team is still in, you know, at least some people on your team are still in place. Um, you have some systems, you have documentation, for example, who um, around kind of how to to continue to do this. And if you have folks at the district level that are supporting you, you can weather that those bumps um, in, in the always staff turnover, but a lot of staff turnover right now. So I would say go back to basics and really think a lot about um, kind of developing a, a representative team, um, as we talked about at the beginning, um, that's not just two people <laughs> that can help with supporting advanced years implementation. Katie, do you have any other advice about that? No, I think that, yeah, I think that's great. Um, there's uh, also a question from Christina. Um, are there any schools or districts <clears throat> that you can connect us with that are integrating tier two interventions at meetings well? That's a great question. She says, my biggest concern is how time is managed to modify interventions. Yeah, <clears throat> for prioritized students and consider new referrals. Yeah, why don't um why don't you send us an email and maybe we can connect you with um, a district. But again, I think some of those those conversations we had around decision rules do, do help to make things a little bit more quick, so that you're focused. You have data sources, you have decision rules, and then you can um, say, okay, we have ten kids on check and check out that are doing just fine. We're not going to talk about them today. Um, we know that those individual student support team meetings can get bogged down in talking about one one student and their concerns. Um, so. I think some of those things that we put, we talked about it getting into place, but also teams can look different depending on the context, right? Yeah, yeah. I think also, um, you know, you can also revisit some of those initial systems around who's on the team. Yeah. And, I, you know, I've been, I've been with high schools that have really large teams and occasionally they will work well, but most of the time... <laughs> Most of the time, the more people you have on the team, kind of the slower it goes and the more, yeah, um, yeah. yeah the harder it is. To like subcommittees, that's helpful. But like, yeah, I think, you know, thinking about a, a good sized team, but not too big of a team, that sweet spot yeah. is always, always tricky to get to, but I think can help with the staff turnover pieces and, um, and also. Yeah, and similarly, teams I think efficient. having a smaller team, um, it makes it a little bit easier to set, okay, this is the process that we're going to follow. And, yeah. you know, this, this person is responsible for bringing this information. This person is responsible for updating, you know, the action plan. This person is responsible for facilitating. If you have a small enough team and it's, you know, I'm thinking like, I don't know, four to six people. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you have a small enough team, you can, everybody has a role, everybody knows what their role and their responsibilities are. And I tend to see those teams be more productive. Working more efficiently. Yeah. yeah. Katie, we just have one minute left. So, um, but thank you all so much. If you have any questions or would like some additional resources, we'd be happy to share them with you. Um, please make sure, you know, uh, our emails are in the PowerPoint. Um, and it's been great to get a chance to talk with you all a little bit about this and share some examples. Um, and uh, yeah, again, please, please let us know if you have any questions. We're happy to follow up with you. Yeah, please reach out if you have questions. I'll drop our um, emails in the chat as well. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Take good care. Thanks, Katie. Thank you.